Well, good afternoon to all of you in attendance today. Welcome to the nearly 500 of you who are attending live or watching the recording of today's congressional briefing, Motherhood on the Brink, the COVID Caregiving and Maternal Mental Health Crises. Thank you to the congressional caucuses who are joining us for today's briefing and to our nonprofit partners for joining us as well. We appreciate your commitment to this issue and these issues and your thought leadership. During today's session, you will hear briefly from each of our panelists. You'll also have an opportunity to share your thoughts and highlights from today's uh, session on social media. We encourage you to use hashtag moms are on the brink and hashtag child care solutions. We invite you to tag Mom Congress and the speaker that you're going to be quoting, if you're quoting a speaker. Their social media handles will be listed on the slides when we introduce them. And next, I want to introduce myself. My name is Joy Burkhardt, and I'm the founder and executive director of 2020 Mom. We're also the host of Mom Congress. 2020 Mom's mission is to close gaps in maternal mental health care. Our goal for Mom Congress is to see this community of mothers grow to the likes of the American Association of Retired People, AARP, and even the National Rifle Association, the NRA. NRA. We believe that motherhood deserves to have a voice as loud and powerful in Washington, D.C. We are here today because American mothers are on the brink. Mothers already felt the critical role, already felt their critical role in building America's future was not recognized given the significant lack of supportive federal policy. Now, given the crisis of COVID and mothers being asked to do even more, caring for their children 24 seven, teaching and working, the mental health of mothers is suffering, and it's time for a motherhood bailout. So what do I mean by the mental health of mothers suffering? You may have seen a recent study by the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC. Uh, in June, the CDC noted that all American adults are reporting considerably elevated adverse mental health associated with COVID-19. This includes increased substance use and elevated thoughts of suicide. Unfortunately, the CDC also highlighted that there's a disproportionate impact on, number one, young adults, i.e. childbearing age women. Number two, racially and ethnically diverse populations. And number three, essential workers, which we all know make up a good portion of mothers and women. And number four, finally, unpaid adult caregivers, i.e. mothers. With the COVID crisis having no end in sight, Mom Congress is asking Congress to address this mother load by investing in immediate solutions to support working mothers and those who've been forced out of jobs and want to get back into the workforce. We're asking for immediate childcare solutions, including options for providing childcare at home. We believe that these priorities are and must be bipartisan priorities. We believe that thriving mothers equal a thriving society and a thriving society equals a thriving future workforce. And to that end, our speakers today will not be talking about politics and parties or even leaders, but instead we'll be focusing on the voices of mothers and the solutions at hand. And next, it's really a pleasure for me to now introduce a Congresswoman, Congresswoman, a mother, a founder of the informal Mothers in the House Caucus, Debbie Washerman Schultz, who we're just thrilled is joining us live today. And now, if I may, turn it over to Congresswoman Washington Schultz. Uh, 
Uh, hi, Debbie, we can't hear you, but we can see you. And our team is going to quickly try to unmute your line. And if you can make sure your phone line is unmuted, we'll be able to hear you. All right, so I think we will come back to the Congresswoman. And Crystal, why don't we go ahead and move to um, Senator Joni Ernst, who is also a mother. We have um, Senator Ernst joining us via video today, and you can see that she serves the state of Ohio. Hi, everyone. This is Senator Joni Ernst from the great state of Iowa. Well, I'm sorry I can't be with you all today. I'm honored to share a few words. Folks, there's no doubt about it. COVID-19 has impacted everyone. But for our new parents, this pandemic has brought unforeseen challenges at such an important time in their lives. As the mother of a beautiful daughter, I can only imagine the stress moms in Iowa and across the country are facing. That's why throughout this pandemic, I've continued to listen to and hear from folks in all corners of my state. One key issue I've heard about and something I've worked on for a long time is supporting our child care providers and the families that rely on these essential workers. In the bipartisan phase two relief package, we provided emergency paid sick leave for workers during COVID-19 and additional emergency family and medical leave for individuals who need to care for a child at home due to school or child care closures. Then through the CARES Act, I worked across the aisle to help secure aid for our child care community and to help cover some of the costs of care for our essential workers. And as a member of the Senate Small Business Committee, I fought to ensure that our child care providers could access the Paycheck Protection Program. With the unpredictability of this virus and its impact on work and school, it's critical we provide additional support for these essential caregivers and their employees. That's why I've proposed the Back to Work Child Care Grants Act of 2020. This will help support families getting back on their feet and parents going back to work by providing critical resources to help child care centers reopen and make it through this crisis. This bill includes nine months of assistance for providers to stabilize the child care industry, allow states to design their own systems for their child care sectors, and gets funds to child care providers as quickly as possible without administrative red tape. It also requires all providers receiving assistance to follow state and local health and safety guidelines and helps them acquire PPE and other equipment and supplies necessary to comply with safety measures, ensuring our children are cared for in a safe environment. Folks, this support is desperately needed. Just last week, a new report showed that half of the licensed child care centers in my state of Iowa have closed during this pandemic. And unfortunately, we're seeing similar trends across the country. Access to quality, affordable child care is essential to our recovery from COVID-19, and it's time for Congress to act. I'll continue pushing my colleagues to do so. Working families in Iowa and across the country are counting on it. Great, well, we appreciate those remarks from Senator Joni Ernst and also her leadership on the issue of childcare. I'm gonna actually ask my colleague, Myra, uh, Joan Smith, Dr. S um, Joan Smith, to introduce, or I'm sorry, to introduce herself and also make remarks on behalf of Zero to Three right now. As everyone knows, we have, we have, um, mothers have children, and children matter, and uh, we actually have Debbie Weinman Schultz on now. We can hear you. Thank you so much, Congresswoman, for joining us, and uh, we apologize that you're having some technical difficulties there. Um, we can't wait to hear from you. You're one of our 
um, most dear, love, love, wonderful, and we're so glad you're here with us today. It looks like you're sitting in your kitchen um, along with many of the moms that we think are watching today. So welcome. Thank you so much. And uh, I apologize for some reason my um, laptop was not allowing me to uh, to access the sound. So I couldn't hear you and you probably weren't going to be able to hear me. But good afternoon. I I'm, I'm so glad to be able to join my, uh, uh, th this really important discussion of motherhood on the brink. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to, to sort of zoom in with you here um, because we really have a crisis of epic proportions and mothers are at the intersection of it. And I was fortunate to have joined Mom Congress at your virtual town hall in May, uh, back in the early days of this pandemic. Um, who would have thought that we would still be in the midst of this crisis in October? And I, I wish today's briefing could be bringing better news, but unfortunately COVID-19 is still devastating our world and just as it was months ago. And I know these are very, very challenging times for everyone, uh, but for women, families with young children and moms, they, they continue to be unprecedented and, and far too often they are punishing. That's why today's congressional briefing is so vital. Now more than ever, we have to come together as legislators, advocates, and policymakers to solve the intersecting challenges this, this crisis has created for mothers across the globe. This very need, the coming together of mothers, is why I formed the Moms in the House Caucus with my colleagues at the start of the 116th Congress. We saw something incredible. With a record number of women running for elected office and winning, um, it, it was fantastic, but it wasn't just eno enough to just have mothers elected to Congress. We had to build something new. When people join a space that wasn't really designed for them, we have to be innovative and carve out the room. So that's what we did. And I knew what it was like to serve in Congress with young children, and it can feel very lonely at times. Um, I didn't want my who were coming in to experience this, especially when for them, there was this possibility with the critical mass for it to be different. And it was important for me that we create a community to support the 28 moms with school-aged children in Congress to share the unique challenges that we face. Mothers are resilient, as uh, I'm sure everyone is smiling uh, while I'm saying that, and as you all know, and this extraordinary group of women is really no exception. During this pandemic, we've used our platform and voices as moms to educate and empower others to stay safe. We filmed videos reminding folks to stay home, videos to remind them to wear masks, and we also did a video jointly together, all of us, uh, honoring our first responders. Hopefully you saw those because uh, we circulated them widely. Our unique perspective as mothers teaches us how to think about others' needs and not just our own. That's kind of our in our mom job description. And during a public health crisis, it is this response, one where we consider our communities, neighbors, and friends that will lead to a successful discovery, a, discuss, a successful recovery, forgive me. I know that at Mom Congress, you talk about the burdens of the mother load, which is something all of us have been co coping with during COVID-19. The working moms lucky, lucky enough to have avoided the virus or recovered from it, but are juggling jobs and childcare with intensity that has not existed in modern times are, are really um, at the pinnacle of, uh, of this crisis. Many moms of young children are homeschooling while you're working. You're preparing lunches while you're working. You might also be policing screen time while working and then dealing with the waves of guilt and stress or resignation that can come with not feeling like you're doing any of those things particularly well. For me personally, being at home for this long, uh, for the first time in 15 years with my three children and husband has been both uh, gratifying and let's just say sometimes challenging. In fact, seconds before I logged on, I was in a little bit of a battle with my college age daughter who is doing her work at the dining room table, just steps from where I am and we were struggling over volume. I know everybody listening to me can relate over the last seven months. And early in the pandemic, for example, I had to miss my twin's 21st birthday to vote on the original HEROES Act. And that was after painstakingly making sure that over the course of my entire career that I never missed their birthday for the first 18 years of their life, even when I had to make Herculean efforts to get home for at least part of it. It was unfortunate, but look, we as working moms, you know, we have to make sacrifices and you have to just make it work. And with people sick, unemployed and dying, casting my vote and using my voice is the very least I can do. Now that was a first world problem, obviously. I know that I'm so fortunate because for many other moms, things are far, far worse. 
September jobs numbers released by the Department of Labor, confirmed what economists and experts had feared. The recession unleashed by the pandemic is sidelining hundreds of thousands of women and wiping out the hard fought gains that they made in the workplace over the past decade. Women and especially women of color are overrepresented in the low paid service economy that got slammed with layoffs. And with many of those jobs paying $12 an hour or less, they're left with little or no cushion to fall back on. And for mothers in particular, this she session has put them once again in, uh, is it my career or is it my job as a mother that comes first? But no parent should ever have to face that choice. And that's why it is vital that the CARES Act that was signed into law in March provided direct payments to individuals and families. And it expanded unemployment insurance and increased small business loans to support women and families. And both versions of the House Passed Heroes Act would extend unemployment insurance and include another round of direct payments to, to those who need them most. And the battle over how much these payments will be and when they will begin and end and so many other important issues to women is, is really just vile to me because these are the, the, a pandemic is not and should not be partisan, but unfortunately has become partisan. Um, and unfortunately, this legislation sits untouched by the Senate. Their, their inaction is just inexcusable. We can't continue to leave millions of families in the lurch. With more than 22 million working families across the country, our nation's economic recovery in the aftermath of this crisis will depend on a system that's gonna be able to bounce back. Mothers and families, we just can't carry the load ourselves. We're, 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 we're pretty good at carrying the load, but you, you need help. We all need help. And that's why it's vital that we support our childcare system. Those who care for and educate the next generation while making it possible for today's parents to earn a living, a living, we, we, they can't do it without resources. And I'm happy to say that the CARES Act included funding for childcare programs like the Child Care and Development Block Grant and Head Start, but far more support is needed. The updated HEROES Act, which passed just a few weeks ago in the House, included over $57 billion for childcare, including $50 billion for a new child care stabilization fund to support the child care industry and its workers. We really need to make sure that the child care industry and its leaders and, and, and employees understand that they are the, C, you're the CEOs of small businesses and that while they need to make sure they have compassion for their families, they also need to make sure that their businesses stay afloat for their families and that stabilization fund will be vital. Millions of families depend on child care every day. But as, not, as moms, you know, that a comprehensive and robust response to counter the, can the cascading effects of COVID-19 is essential, and we still have significant work to be done. We need a system in this country that will support us as mothers, as women, and as working people. Our recovery from this pandemic depends on it. So finally, throughout the coronavirus pandemic, mothers have carried an inordinate brunt of the care, of, this, of the care of schooling and the workload, too often without equal support or an equal voice. And it gives me great hope that Mom Congress is examining different solution-oriented ways to confront the mother load of this crisis. Throughout my career, both in the state legislature and in Congress, fighting for women and families has always been one of my top priorities. And that's why it's so important that we elect more of us. Because when you have policymakers looking through the, the, the lens of a mother, of someone making it all work and trying to balance work and family, our issues rocket to the top of the legislative agenda. And that's why so many of my colleagues who aren't moms of young kids joining us in Congress was critical. I promise to continue this fight alongside you during these precarious times. So thank you, Mom Congress, and everyone here today for being a part of this important discussion and advocating on behalf of moms and your families across this country. And I hope you all remain safe and healthy during these unprecedented times and look forward to welcoming you to the Capitol once it's, when it's once again safe to do so. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Congresswoman Schultz, uh, Washington Schultz. We appreciate you so much, and thanks for coming back to Mom Congress to speak sure. to our audience and also your colleagues on the Hill. Um, it's a pleasure to have you, and want to let our staff know that, or our team uh, attendees know, rather, that you're welcome to um, look at the uh, Mom Congress blog, mom-congress.com, to learn more about the CARES Act and also the HEROES Act. Thank you all so much. Take care. Take care. Excellent. And now I get to welcome back my colleague, uh, 
Myra Jones Taylor, not Smith. I caught myself as I said that earlier. Um, Dr. Myra Jones Taylor is the chief policy officer at Zero to Three. She leads the uh, development and implementation of the nonprofit organization's policy agenda, including federal and state priorities and strategies to support young children and, of course, moms too. Um, with that, Dr. Jones. Taylor, not Smith, um, I welcome you back to the stage. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Joy. And good afternoon, everyone. And thank you to Senator Ernst and Representative Wasser Wasserman Schultz uh, for joining us today. And of course, as well as Joy uh, Burkhardt and Moms Con Mom Congress for bringing us all together today. My name is Myra Jones Taylor, and I'm the Chief Policy Officer at Zero to Three, a nonprofit that is dedicated to making sure that all young children, all babies and toddlers, have a strong start in life, which is a mission, of course, that has grown even more complicated and essential with the COVID 19 pandemic. This year, we've seen families from every walk of life struggle with the virus's impact, whether it's dealing with a loved one getting sick, losing their childcare arrangements or in many cases, finding themselves unable to meet their children's basic needs like food or diapers. And over the last few months, I've been lucky enough to work with a dedicated group of researchers out of the University of Oregon, as they put together what they call the Rapid Assessment of Pandemic Impact on Development Early Childhood Survey, or as we often call it, the Rapid EC Survey. And this team has been tracking the devastating impact that COVID-19 has had on families many of whom were struggling long before the virus arrived. The data shows that income loss, financial difficulties, and material hardship, uh, including the loss of childcare, of course, are concentrated in households with very young children. Families are now facing new stressors as they supervise online learning while also caring for their young children. And it should be no surprise to anyone that black and brown children, as well as our families, as well as families with lower income are harder hit than most. And as financial difficulties increase, uh, the recent research that I just referred to shows that emotional stress, distress for both caregivers and children rise. And as this stress persists over time, it can undermine the foundational brain development on which all later learning and success uh, rest. But these trends are not new. They're just becoming worse. And when Zero to Three released the 2020 State of Babies yearbook this summer, we explored how the state a baby is born makes a huge difference in their lives. But we also confirmed what we already knew, which is that black and brown babies start at a major disadvantage no matter where in the United States they live. And while we worry about things like eviction now, before the pandemic, Latinx families were four times as likely as white babies to live in crowded housing, and black babies were twice as likely. Of course, food insecurity has stopped many families during the pandemic, but before the crisis, Black and Latinx families with children were twice as likely as white households to be food insecure. So we know COVID has exposed the threadbare system that purport to support our babies and families and has deepened the crisis many families have faced for years. Our elected officials need to place infants, toddlers, and their families at the center of their work and implement policies that will identify disparities and make the potential of every baby a national priority. Otherwise, far too many, for far too many, this pandemic may never come to an end. And on that very distressing note, I have the, the honor and the great pleasure of introducing my fellow panelists, or the, the panelists, I'm not a panelist. Um, and first, I would like to start by introducing Katherine Goldstein. Katherine Goldstein is the creator and host of Double Shift Productions, an independent journalism country uh, company. She's an award-winning journalist who is an expert on working mothers. Katherine's article in Huffington Post this summer titled, The Mothers of America Need a Bailout, This Could Be the Answer, has struck an urgent chord among mothers and policymakers. Katherine? Okay. I think you can hear and see me. <laughs> uh, Myra, uh, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, Joy, thank you so much for having me. I love talking with Mom Congress. Um, I was at uh, the conference last spring um, because it's such a passionate group of people committed to change. And um, I just feel like you all um, 
have so much energy. And so even though we're not together in person, I hope uh, you all will are as energized as ever. Um, as Myra said, I'm the creator and host of uh, the Double Shift, uh, which is a podcast, which is about a new generation of working mothers. And our third season came out today. So, um, and I just wanna sort of start off. Um, being here, I wanna sort of go over how we got to this moment of complete crisis for women in the workforce. Because I think we can all agree that we're in a, a really, really tough uh, situation and we're basically in triage mode, but we need to understand the decades of culture and public policy that got us here in order for us to make long-term positive um, change going forward. So um, uh, as you can see on the screen, uh, these are all situations, uh, th th these were all realities before COVID. Um, if you chose to have a baby during your childbearing years, 25 to 35, your earnings uh, will, statistically we're likely to never recover relative to a male partner. So basically if you have a baby between 25 and 35, you are relegating yourself to a lifetime of uh, lower earnings, which has a huge impact um, on women's uh, ability for economic independence and imp impact in the workforce. You know, uh, obviously we have an, some new paid family leave as a result of um, the CARES Act, but before the pandemic, uh, paid family leave of any kind was really a rarity. Only 19% of, of workers at all in this country have had access to it, and not all workers can access the, the newest uh, family leave that has been passed. Um, in terms of the situation with childcare, you know, I think everyone here probably understands that we're in a crisis, but just getting back to where we were before is really not going to be is not close to good enough. Um, we were already, America already had tons of childcare deserts, what, meaning that, um, uh, meaning there was far less spots for licensed childcare providers than there were children. And over half of the country lived in one of these neighborhoods that's considered a childcare desert. Um, and uh, as we're talking about the impact, um, uh, Senator Ernst also mentioned this as we're talking about the impact on families. Also, the impact of childcare workers are some of the lowest paid workers in the country. Um, there's tons of, uh, you know, we say we, we value our children and their education and their care, but um, these are some of the lowest paid and most undervalued uh, workers in the, in the country and often uh, women of color, often mothers themselves. Um, so, uh, in a study that we, uh, a study that um, Motherly Media put together before the pandemic, 85% of women felt the U.S. did not do a good job of supporting and understanding mothers. I mean, that number doesn't surprise me. I wonder, you know, what the other 15% <laughs> was thinking. Basically, I, I think um, America has not has not done a good job of helping us um, at this moment and or leading up to this moment. And so that's sort of why we find ourselves in such an acute crisis. All of these factors have played into, you know, the fact that the the motherhood penalty, uh, or so, I'm sorry, to back up, we talk a lot about the gender wage gap, but basically the gender wage gap is actually between mothers and everybody else. Men and women earn approximately the same amount of money. It's mothers who earn significantly less. So all of these factors have led to, um, this incredibly uh, dire moment. And I, a number that I wanna highlight that many um, of you, I'm sure we're gonna continue to talk about over the course of this um, session and that many of you may have seen in news reports, but um, 865,000 women left the workforce between August and September. So um, I'm a journalist, and so part of my job is to put together the dots and sort of think about, um, you know, what is going, why is that happening? Um, and I think you could, I think the really large picture here is if you think about what happened in the country between August and September is that kids started to go back to school. And for many, many, many of us, that is virtual school. So, and as we know, dealing with virtual school is a full-time job and we haven't provided um, uh, families with the support they need to really see that as a job. I, you know, I think that there's a ton of different things that we need to be thinking about. Um, I 
personally believe parents should be being paid to be stay home and doing virtual school. It absolutely is a full-time job that needs to be treated as such. And um, I think that we really are at a crisis moment where um, we need to do, from a policy perspective, short-term things to stop the bleeding, but we also need to think about the big picture. So we do not see not just 10 years of of progress wiped out, but a generation of progress wiped out. I think that we absolutely are at risk of that. And if we continue with these women not just taking temporary, temporary exits from the workforce, really have been forced out, it's going to affect um, women not reaching leadership positions, not running for office, not contrib contributing research, not getting tenure in academic institutions, not being the people who can make private and public policies and not mentoring the next generation. So I think all of this is really, really important. And um, I hope that today we have some really exciting opportunities to talk about, you know, really a kitchen sink approach. Um, there's no one solution to the, this challenge. And I think we need federal, a federal infusion of, of, of money um, to address you know, large scale, small scale, and I hope that people can find things that really would make a difference in their own communities and we can continue to advocate for federal involvement um, because there really is no one solution, but um, but we really need to be working on this so we're not having, wondering 20 years from now, like why we didn't do anything in this moment. I'll, I'll leave, I'll end there. Thank you so much. Thank you for your leadership for your for your writing, Catherine. We really appreciate it. Now I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Lori Todd Smith, who is the director of the Women's Bureau. Dr. Lori Todd Smith of Mississippi was appointed by President Trump to lead the Women's Bureau in October of 2019. She brings more than 25 years of experience in education and research to the Women's Bureau. She is the former executive director of the State Workforce Investment Board and the State Early Childhood Advisory Council in Mississippi. Dr. Todd Smith, it's wonderful to have you. Thank you so much. It's so nice to be here today. And thank you so much for inviting me to speak on such an important topic about child care and working women. Uh, the, the Women's Bureau is the only federal agency that is tasked with representing the needs of working women. And we're celebrating our 100 year anniversary as we were formed on June 4th of 1920. And uh, one of the things that we uh, ha have worked on, not me personally for 100 years, but what the Women's Bureau has been focused on is trying to communicate the needs of working women. And there's no time like the present of, of what we're learning about what women need uh, during this pandemic. So uh, in general, uh, the topics the Women's Bureau is focused on right now is expanding access to and affordability to childcare. Um, and we are doing some uh, impact studies of the child and dependent care credit. Uh, we're also working on a database to uh, understand the cost of childcare across the United States. Of course, we had started on this prior to the pandemic, but we will have a um, a database of all of the um, child care costs at the county level for every state in the United States. So it will be a really good tool for state governments to use researchers, employers, and others to really have a good understanding of the, the true cost per county. We're focused also on paid leave at the Women's Bureau. We just published a request for information soliciting feedback on a public paid leave policy. But we are very focused on understanding the impact of COVID-19 and so much of today's conversation is about that. Um, we are analyzing the impact on the workforce participation rate and the quality of the data that is available uh, is something you're gonna hear me talk a lot about in the next few minutes here. Um, we use the Bureau of Labor Statistics data to really uh, try to understand what is happening during this time. Um, we're also going to be combining available data with a broad public survey uh, this year on working women and really trying to understand how women are being affected, but also how they want to see it in the future. Has COVID-19 changed women's attitudes towards work or childcare or parenting? 
Uh, we don't necessarily know if women just want to reverse the course to the landscape that's been before, as we heard uh, this earlier in, in some of the remarks, or, or do they really want something different after this experience? So if you will bear with me, I, I am going to share some data to you. So on my next slide, uh, it's up right now, um, you can see, uh, I want to make it clear, though, that when we talk about the female workforce, for, female workforce and what it looked like before COVID, the best way to kind of talk about how it looks now is to also look at, at pre-COVID, at the 2019 data. That data in 2019 included the workforce participation rate for women based on their age and their youngest child in the household and their marital status. Some of those data points we don't have in the 2020 data yet. So in my first slide there um, that you see the women in the labor force by the age of children, these are all women in the, in the workforce, um, ages 16 plus that are working full-time and part-time in the labor force. You can see that 67% of the female workforce does not have children under the age of 18. Keep in mind, 16 plus, full-time, part-time data. 20% have children ages 6 to 17. 13% have children ages under 6. And on the, the slide to the right of that, you see that 48% of working women are married, even uh, and 33% have never been married, and 19% of women in the workforce in 2019 were either divorced, separated, or widowed. So um, that, you know, just some background data of where we, we started and what data is available. But I think it's important to note that the more detailed 2019 annual averages are going to be released in December 2020. And the 2020 annual averages get released in December of 2021. So it's really going to be a long time before we fully understand the impact of COVID-19 on the workforce as specifically as it relates to motherhood and marital status. But to understand this a little bit more, in my next slide, uh, you can see the unemployment rate for full-time versus part-time women. Again, looking at ages 16 plus, so you really have to keep that, that whole workforce perspective. It is broken down by women but it makes it a little easier as we look at this. So in chart one, you can see that part-time working women, the orange line, experienced a greater spike of unemployment than full-time women, which is the uh, blue line. Um, and that spike was 25.6% part-time for women, uh, and the spike was 16.2% in April for full-time working women. So part-time women experienced the highest rate of unemployment of all women that were collected um, during that time with a rate of 23.8% uh, in April. The other chart in the middle, um, the, uh, the other group that was greatly impacted are single women, and that's the green line in that uh, graphic. Um, those women faced the peak unemployment rate of 20.7% in April which fortunately right now in September has been cut in half to 10.7%, still not where we want it to be, but um, it, it is recovering to some extent. Married women, the blue line, experienced the least or the smallest spike in unemployment rate in April at 12.8% and have recovered to 5.9% in September. And the chart on the right is just noting that the unemployment doubled for each racial cohort of people that are covered there, um, although it's not, it, it was the most increased for Hispanic women in the United States. So the pandemic has actually hit married women the least, only increasing 3.6% for this cohort, and compared to 5.5% of women who were never married. So it, it's just an interesting way to look at the data with the facts that we do have and uh, thinking about that with part-time workers and how that affects all the stories that you've already shared, but these are the actual data points that we have. Um, the next slide, my uh, labor force participation rate is also another uh, way that we look at it. And I'm going back to change one thing in how I describe this data now on um, that 
labor force participation rate. So instead of looking at women just 16, all women in the uh, 16 plus, all women in the workforce, um, I want to focus on this one specifically on prime age working women, which are considered ages 25 to 54. Um, I'm getting really old because I'm right at that brink of uh, the prime age working women. But I want to I want to point out on this that uh, as we look at it uh, broken down by race and the and the numbers of labor force uh, participation rate of Black women ages 25 to 54 is generally higher than that of other groups except uh, in July and August, it, it kind of levels off there. But black women were the only group to see an increase in labor force participation between August and September. It went from 74.5 to 75.3. But overall black women pre-COVID had a higher workforce participation rate than white women, but they have also experienced a bigger impact during this COVID-19 time. And the Graphic on the right, going back to what I said earlier about marital status, I'm going back to the age of, of 16 and all women in the workforce, uh, ages 16 plus, part-time and full-time. We won't know that data till uh, after 2020. But remember that single women had dropped out of the workforce more than married women and uh, pre from COVID-19 falling from 65.9 in February to a low of 59.5 in April. So single women have been disproportionately affected, but we don't know their age groups. We don't know the number of children that they have. We don't know the age of children and all the other details that I was able to provide to you from that previous year. So I just, as, as we make decisions and we talk about the need right now, I also just really want to, I, I, I think data helps really guide good policy that will help specifically of what we need to do um, as a nation moving forward. The Women's Bureau is also um, going to plan to do, as I mentioned, surveys across the United States to gain more information, to combine it with this Bureau of Labor Statistics data to tell the whole story of working women um, and the impact of COVID-19. My last slide very quickly is just to talk about apprenticeships, and I know we'll talk more on the end of this in, in a group setting, but as we think about women uh, dropping out of the workforce and coming back, there are so many uh, opportunities and occupations and women may be considering um, different pathways, and apprenticeships is such a great way to, to experience uh, uh, different pathways into the workforce that we may not have considered in the past. Uh, the Women's Bureau just awarded $4.1 million to uh, different states, uh, state of Washington, California, Illinois, Florida, Texas, and New York, to explore women in non-traditional occupations, and we'll be sharing um, uh, findings from those in the near future. So I'll I'll stop there and turn it back over to you, but I just wanted to share the data and, and share the information of the Women's Bureau, and I'm certainly happy to share even more of that. It's hard to uh, make it fit into five to seven minutes, but I uh, look forward to the rest of the conversation and how we can help women uh, in the workforce. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Todd Smith, and you did a great job of getting it in there, so thank you. Uh, I would now now I'd like to introduce Dr. Samantha Meltzer Brody. Uh, she is the Asad Mimandi Distinguished Professor and Chair of the Department of Psychiatry at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She also directs the UNC Center for Women's Mood Disorders and leads the UNC SOM and UNC Health Wellbeing Initiative. And I'm sorry, I don't have the acronym for SOM. Maybe you can tell us, but welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Dr. Meltzer Brody, we cannot hear you. Uh, that's, all right, here, here we, we go. go. Yes, it's a pleasure to be here today. Thanks so very much for the introduction. Um, SOM is the School of Medicine at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And I'm delighted to share a perspective as a perinatal psychiatrist um, and champion for um, women's mental health and for um, the perinatal period for moms um, and really have just been moved by all the um, conversations and discussions I've heard today so far. So COVID has not been kind to moms, as we've been hearing. And I just want to highlight a few things that pre-pandemic, 
we know that perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, um, you'll hear this term um, in the psychiatric literature, um, in the lay literature, you're, you'll hear it called maternal mental health, is common. Um, it is one of the most common and morbid conditions of the perinatal period. It's at least 10 to 15 percent in the general population. You see higher rates um, in populations that have more risks. And this is anyone during pregnancy and um, postpartum who gives birth. The underlying cause is not entirely known. It's considered multifactorial, past history of depression, um, hormonal pathways, inflammatory signaling, dysregulation of stress pathways, um, dysregulation of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, GABA dysfunctioning. And we know it's also more heritable or more genetic. So one of the things of great interest to uh, my work, but also that we know from the literature is that women with perinatal depression have an increased genetic risk compared to women that have depression at any other time of their life outside of the perinatal period. A few other things to note about perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. They can be devastating. So you're talking about low mood, depression, often co-occurring anxiety, intrusive or ruminating thoughts. Moms will have difficulty sleeping, um, not be able to sleep even when the new baby is sleeping, or conversely, just want to sleep all the time and sort of appear checked out. You can see changes in appetite, concentration, um, and some of the most concerning symptoms are suicidal thoughts. Um, in fact, maternal mortality from suicide is one of the greatest causes of um, maternal um, morbidity and death, and um, rarely psychosis. But all of these combined, it becomes a really dramatic crisis for moms. The stress of having a new baby um, is always profound and, and can be wonderful. Um, but for moms that are then hit with one of the most common complications of childbirth, it can be just devastating and a crisis for the entire family. Um, next slide. And so what we're seeing now is that during the pandemic, um, these things are all exacerbated. So the cost for new mothers' untreated mental health issues is billions. It's not millions, it's billions. And Mathematica, in a wonderful report of uh, a number of researchers um, led by Dr. Karen um, Zivin, who's with Mathematica in Ann Arbor, Michigan, um, demonstrated that uh, mental health issues, maternal health, mental health issues, not only weigh down new mothers, but they often go untreated, and that was $14.2 billion in economic cost. This is a very elegant study um, that really uses state-of-art epidemiolo epidemiology and um, health economics approaches to look at the cost. This is the cost of untreated illness in moms. And unfortunately, the majority of new mothers um, who have mental health concerns do not receive treatment or um, adequate treatment. Next slide. And so COVID then, as we've heard, is causing enormous distress. And so all the things that moms need, um, the support during pregnancy and the postpartum period has been markedly disrupted by the COVID pandemic. Um, you generally have you know, a food train of people coming by to visit, um, family support, grandmothers, sisters, aunties coming in to stay with you, friends, and much of this has been markedly disrupted. This has led to increased social isolation, um, as well as just enormous fears about health and COVID exposure to moms and babies. Um, all of these things, and we're very clear, are, are worsening maternal mental health and increasing the prevalence of perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. Next slide. And so where we are now, um, there's been a number of papers coming out. This one came out last month. Um, the COVID pandemic necessitates worldwide action to strengthen both public health interventions promoting perinatal mental health and the capacity of mental health care services to support and enable the resilience of families dealing with the cumulative social and economic stressors at times of crisis. Um, there are many groups now talking about this. We are seeing in our very large clinical research program at UNC an enormous need um, for perinatal mood and anxiety disorder treatment. Um, we see a huge need and the complexity of families that are impacted by the economic hardship of the COVID pandemic, by the 
um, issues around racism, um, the subsequent trauma for, for those families impacted, um, as well as um, just how common perinatal mood and anxiety disorders are in general. All of these things combined um, create a very, very dire and serious situation that requires all of us to think differently. Um, again, to highlight, um, moms who aren't treated have worse morbidity and mortality that is worse for their children. Um, it is also one of the greatest causes of suicide for mothers, and we are seeing rates of suicide just go up in general um, in really frightening ways. Next slide. And so multiple studies, um, as I've said, have demonstrated the significant distress. Um, we know one of the greatest risk factors for postpartum depression is stress and distress during pregnancy itself. Um, and so we're seeing as women are pregnant now, um, the stress that is on them is increasing their risk for postpartum mood and anxiety disorders. Um, and most pregnant women, there's two recent reports that have come out are demonstrating severe psychological impact of the pandemic. So um, a study in August in the American Journal of um, OBGYN and a study um, also in August that came out um, in the Journal of Affective Disorders, both of these are showing the really intense impact um, and, and trauma, if you will, and psychological impact of the COVID pandemic on pregnant women, which is going to markedly increase their risk of postpartum depression because we know that um, mental health concerns during pregnancy increase postpartum risk, and we're beginning to see that all play out now. Next slide. And so just to close by saying, um, I am deeply concerned as a physician scientist um, and a public health champion at what we're seeing boots on the ground in our clinical programs. Um, one thing that has been a bright spot is that telepsychiatry um, has been more widely available now than ever before. That is a bright spot, and I would say we all have to do everything we can to preserve that the payers, both public and private insurance, will continue to pay for that um, so that you're able to have moms get help um, as they need it, given that the prevalence and the severity of perinatal mood and anxiety disorders are markedly compromised compromising maternal mental health at this time, and this will only have really horrible outcomes for both moms, um, babies, their children, long-term development, and families. So I'm really, it's just an honor to be here today and, and share some, some thoughts, and I'm so glad Mom Congress is coming together to advocate for our mothers. Thank you. Oh, Myra, uh, we cannot hear you. Oh, you sure can. Thank you. Thank there you, Dr. Go. Meltzer Brody. It's such a pleasure to hear those, those slides are really compelling. Thank you for your research and your leadership. And now I'd like to introduce uh, an old friend and colleague, uh, Linda Smith, who is the director of the Bipartisan Policy Center's Early Childhood Development Initiative. She was most recently, uh, most recently served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Early Childhood Development in the Administration for Children and Families at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, where we first met uh, many years ago. Linda, it's so good to see you, please. It's great to see you, Myra, and I, I was thinking as I was getting ready for this, I, I've seen more of you on, on webinars than I saw when you, when you were in uh, Connecticut, so this is great. Um, I want to thank Joy and Mom Congress for inviting me to be a part of this, and hopefully I'm looking forward to the conversation at the end of this. Also to thank the Senator and the Congresswoman because they represent exactly what BPC is trying to do, which is to reach across the aisle and find solutions to current problems that can be supported by both sides. So if you skip the next couple of slides and we'll get right into the next slide. So what I'm going to talk to you today about are what's going on with childcare. And uh, when we started working on this particular issue of parents in childcare arrangements, we started talking about it in part because of what Catherine uh, alluded to in her remarks, and that was the childcare deserts in the country where there wasn't any childcare and we really didn't know what was going on about why there weren't and what was where, where children were in some of these areas. So we did a survey about a year ago this time to start looking at this. What are parents' preferences for care? Why are they choosing some of the things they're doing? And then where do we go to try and figure out a little bit more how to support parents? 
obviously we did a, a pivot in in march of this last year to look at the impact of covid we were ready to go out with another survey to dig deeper into parent choice and then figured out we needed to really look at the impact of covid so we did that one of the things that we have found through the work is that there is a fairly large percentage of families that are using family members for care whether in the first slide it shows uh, the one the increase from January the parents prior to COVID and then now 32 percent of parents using so the increase in parents using family members for care has gone up with COVID not a surprise but the question for us has always been what was going on with the 21 percent before and then you might ask well what's going on in it's sort of the rest of it is 13 percent were are alternating work hours with someone in their household and there's a number of other things. You can go to the survey and see this. There's many are reducing their hours, um, so forth and so on. So what's parents' work status? Well, 44% of parents reported in August that they aren't gonna be, are unable to go back to work without some form of childcare. No surprise that it's higher for parents with lower incomes. Hispanic and black parents uh, report different circumstances. So when it goes to, re next slide, returning to childcare, parents are split on what they plan to do in terms of sending their children back to care. With a fairly significant population, close to 60% of parents surveyed saying they don't plan to send their children back to care anytime soon. And you'll see in a minute some of the concerns about why that is but they're waiting, some parents are waiting for schools to open, which we're starting to see right now. Some are waiting for a vaccine. Some are waiting for their particular program to open up again. So it's a mixed bag, but there's a lot of ambivalence on parents' part about putting their children back in care until they feel safe. So if you go to the next uh, slide, please, this just shows the of the you know what parents were saying. So 91% of parents say they are most comfortable with that family member or a relative caring for their children. And that's a real standout. And I think we've got a ways to go for with child care until parents return into the into the more formal system. And I want to talk about that in just a second because that is has a big impact. And it was what Senator Ernst was talking about in her remarks about needing to stabilize child care in the interim until parents are comfortable putting their children back. So I think the, the next one is obviously not a surprise to anybody on this call that parents are very concerned about the exposure of their children and other family members to COVID. And so that's going to be right out there and in front of us for quite some time. To the next slide, what they're most, um, what they're looking for and what is most important to them about children going back or their, a child care program. You see it here. There are a number of other things that they expressed interest in, in, in terms of you know, sort of what they want to see in their program, but these were the standouts with sanitizing. And if it's any comfort to the moms on this call, I would tell you, I, I was saying this to a colleague this morning, that if there's one thing childcare providers know is sanitation and hand washing. They, that's in their genes. And I think uh, childcare providers have long understood the connection of disease spread to hand washing and some of the sanitizing toys, et cetera. The other things, temperature checks, um, testing for staff and masks were among the other things. So then going to the next slide. So what's going on with childcare right now, on the other hand, um, this is of a concern to all of us. And again, why Senator Ernst is, is working on uh, legislation on this. If you look at uh, the two standouts on this, really uh, the great share of parents are either report that either their child care provider is closed or operating with limited hours or space. So this is probably going to be this most serious thing. And you go back to the parents who are concerned about the the uh, sort of the, the concern about health and when they're going to be ready to go back we have a real disconnect with keeping programs viable until parents are willing and ready to go back to them. On the far left-hand side, you see that 9% of childcare providers 
uh, parents said their child care providers were closed permanently, that number is higher for centers with 14% of centers closed permanently, according to the parents. So we've got some serious problems between the demand side of the house, which is where when parents are going to go back to child care and having a supply there when that time comes. A couple of other things that we learned in the survey, just to the next slide, that's complicating things for all of us in childcare is the issue of school-aged children and the fact that many programs are operating on a on a either a modified schedule or remotely, et cetera, putting a lot of children in a situation or parents in a situation where their children now need care at different times and is that care there and a lot of those parents as the on the right indicates those parents were not prepared to pay for child care it wasn't in their budget and now they're all of a sudden faced with child care expenses that they didn't plan on and in some cases don't have the resources to pay so those are all very serious issues i think the one when it comes to policy policy solutions and we're going to talk about this we have a couple of things that we really need to think about. We need to think about the parents who are using family care and how do we support them? And that not all parents now or in the future will want formal care. So what do we do with that? What do we do to keep childcare viable over the next probably year until next fall when we hope things get back completely to normal? So there's that. And then, it, you know, just what do we do with parents who are at home right now trying to juggle all this? And as we've heard from others, the stress on parents is enormous. So how do we begin to think about supporting parents in their role as both providers and by that I mean in the workforce as well as uh, raising children. So with that I'm going to turn it back over to Myra and look forward to the conversation about policy solutions that the audience might think would be viable. Thank you so much Linda and you're right we really now that we live in the same town we should actually try to see each other. <laughs> That's true. So now uh, and thank you so much for your for your leadership and your words it's really you make a powerful case. I would love to now introduce Blessing Adichian, who is the founder and CEO of Villo, as well as Mother Honestly. Uh, Villo is a startup tackling the burnout epidemic and caregiving crisis by offering a remote personal and household manager as a benefit to employees. And Mother Honestly is a motherhood community and solution-driven platform that propels working women forward. Blessing, it's so great to have you. Please. Love to hear from you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, th thank you, everyone, and thank you so much, Joy, for um, for the invitation. Um, really appreciate that, and it's so nice to see all of my wonderful friends as well, like Catherine, um, who wrote that wonderful article that basically fired all of us up. So really, really appreciate you, Catherine, if you're still um, online. So just a little bit about me. Um, I am the founder and CEO of Mother Honestly. I also just started a startup, um, which came about as a result of some of the things that we were hearing from our mothers within the Mother Honestly community. Um, we we host multiple surveys um, at Mother Honestly, whether through our podcasts, social media platform, conferences, and email. Um, and one of the one of the resounding theme that we've seen um, is that motherhood is just unsustainable. It was unsustainable before the pandemic. Um, what you're reading here is literally um, copy that was written before the pandemic. So we already knew how hard it is to be a mother in the 21st century. We're living in a society that was built for men. It was built for a single earner family. And so we now have a situation where we have two incomes families. So we call that dual career couples. And a lot of those working mothers that so many of the panelists have shared before um, fall into this category. These women are breadwinners and co-breadwinners. I believe the number is 70% of women are co-breadwinners or breadwinners. And what that means is that these are not women with light careers, right? If you are a breadwinner, it means that you have a serious career. And it also means that your income, your family depends on your income. And so when we see those statistics of women being forced out of the workforce, millions of women, 
it should really force us to think about the income um, that these women are losing. Um, and for women to actually be so prepared to drop their careers despite the income gap, that should signal a re that should signal some kind of urgency to us that this is a serious issue. Um, and so when we started talking about what are the different solutions, uh, but thank you so much for moving on to the next slide. When we started talking about what are the different solutions, we asked moms, so we have a motherhood and work survey that we throw around every so often on our social media platforms and our emails. And we surveyed thousands of working mothers on how they are coping with the effects of COVID-19. And thousands and thousands of them responded that they are not doing well at all. I mean, that was the resounding thing, that we're not doing well. I'm working more after bedtime. It's exhausting. I can't do this anymore. I am going crazy. Another theme that we saw was that their partners were not stepping up. So these, these are men that depend on their income, right? The entire family depend on mom's income um, as well. And partners are not stepping up. So we have an issue of unpaid labor at home, as well as that lack of value that we already experience out in society. And we also experience that at home. So women were basically battling two different things. Um, on the paid front and on the unpaid front. Um, another theme that we heard was employers were running out of patients. Um, I don't know if you guys, if you all have seen the statistics around, you know, employers that support childcare right now. I believe it's less than 5% of the American employers that provide some sort of backup childcare or some sort of support um, for childcare for their employees. So we're looking at a situation where mom doesn't is not supported at work and she's not supported at home. Um, can we go on to the next slide, please? So these are just highlights of the survey that we completed. 98% of working moms are burned out. And I asked those 2%, what are you thinking? Uh, because I am burned out myself and I have three kids. So my kids, are, I have a baby, I have a toddler and I have a teen in a pandemic. I actually have been joking that all I need to do now is to get pregnant and I will be experiencing all the different phases of motherhood all at once in this pandemic. So that should signal to us that life has not stopped for women, right? I, I think when we think about this um, situations that we've all found ourselves, we think of it in a, as, a, as a, it's almost like a one lens, right? Women are still doing things. Women are still growing their families. Women are still, you know, cooking and cleaning. They still have to take care of their family. They still have to take care of their elder ones. They still have to take care of their pets. So there's a lot of different factors that is that we are seeing compounding into this burnout that moms are experiencing. 41% already is considering leaving the workforce. So that is about, I think when we did the math, that is about 17.6 million moms that are literally on the brink of leaving the workforce. That should signal a serious situation for us as a society and as a collective. Childcare is a major concern due to the shortages and potential COVID-19 outbreaks. What we're hearing is, is essentially that for some moms, childcare is available, but there is really no, they, they, they don't feel comfortable. They don't have enough, they don't think that there's enough um, safety um, protocols out there for their kids to actually remain safe when they go to school. Some of them have babies at home. So you know, they, their wheels are turning. If I send my 10 year old or my five year old who isn't exactly the best hand sanitizing toddler um, and they bring COVID-19 back and I get exposed or the baby gets exposed, what does that mean? We're also looking at these different impact in all of the different facets, right, of motherhood. When we look at the finances, 73% of our moms said that their finances have been impacted. What that means is that they've either lost their jobs or they've scaled back. Um, either the, um, the, their partner has scaled back or they've scaled back. A lot of those moms are also Black moms. So we now know, um, and we already know, that 84% of Black moms are breadwinners for their family. So when you see that high number, a lot of those um, moms that have been affected are women of color. These are black moms. These are these are Hispanic Latino moms that basically, um, you know, almost live on, you know, from paycheck to paycheck. A lot of them are caregivers, and we know that caregivers have been affected in this pandemic. 
we also see that 66% of our moms, have, their career has been affected, whether that's, you know, um, scaling back or they have, you know, they've not been able to, um, their, their request for flexibility has not been approved or they've had some kind of, um, you know, what we've heard from a lot of moms is that, you know, my employer is running out of patience, I'm getting more work. Um, actually, 70% of our moms said they have, their workload has increased as a result of the pandemic. So not only is the workload at home increased, you now have more workload on the work front. And so that is just not helping. Um, and we're going to get to the mental health. And you see why that number has really um, skyrocketed because mom is being slammed on both fronts. It's almost like, you know, a moving train and a car colliding. And then another train is coming right behind you. It's a lot for moms right now, and it's unsustainable. One thing that we haven't really talked about a lot is their relationship. Moms are going through a lot. Um, I, I think I mentioned very briefly about how, you know, a lot of them are saying that, you know, their partners are not exactly helping. Oh, my partner is not pulling, is not pulling um, his weight. One of, when we asked mom, what is the biggest challenges you're facing during this pandemic? One woman responded, husband with a period. And that was like, that was the only answer she had for us. So this is to tell you that, you know, women are facing a lot of challenges in their relationships right now. And that is not helping that number that we're about to talk about, which is the mental health. 94% of moms have, they are emotionally and mentally distraught. Um, you know, when, when they're thinking about their finances, one woman said, I had to leave, you know, my, I had to sell my law firm right before the pandemic. And now I'm going through a lot because I feel like I don't, I can't do a lot of the work at home. My husband is not exactly valuing my career and my and me being home. So there's just a lot that women are going through right now. And if we can move on to the, if I, I I'm not sure if I have another slide, but if not, I can just wrap up. And so one of the ways that we've, one of the questions that we've asked mom is what can, what is critical right now? And a lot of them have come, they came back to us saying, we want support from my employers. Um, we want companies that support us because we really want to stay in the workforce. Um, let's keep in mind, these women that are leaving the workforce or being forced out of the workforce, they're not leaving because they want to leave. They're leaving because they have no choice. They have no choice because they need to take care of their kids. They need to you know, supervise virtual learning. And I can get, use myself as an example. Um, up until August 31st, I was working full time as a chemical engineer for a major major chemical um, company, um, one of the largest in the world. And I have been working in my career for the past um, decade and a half. And because of the pandemic, because of everything happening, I decided that it was just not sustainable. I have three kids and, you know, my husband is not willing to leave the workforce. And although we have a great marriage and a great relationship, much of the burden of the caregiving still falls on me. Um, so there's a lot of work that we all need to do individually and collectively and as a society to actually get um, to achieve gender equity at home and in the workplace. So what we've seen is that employers are actually losing 780 million hours per week. This is as a result of the state of the working parent survey by Clio, by the way. And what you are seeing is that this is unsustainable, not just for moms, but also for the employer. And we started thinking about what are different ways that we can get employers to support working parents right now um, because change is not coming fast enough we just kind of need some kind of something to stop the bleed and so we started talking to employers and we um a lot of people the people that follow us know that we host one of the largest conferences for working mothers um we are the pulse of working mothers in america and you know one of the latest caregiving and work summits that we hosted just two weeks ago touched on exactly what employers need to do right now to support working parents and that's what you see on the screen here empathy and flexibility was number one and i think that goes for every one of us whether you're an individual whether you're a collective or you're part of this or you're or, or, or you're a policy maker i think just having that empathy and being flexible in your request when you need something providing a much more um wider bandwidth or a much more wider range um for for receiving that action item back right whether it's whether it's also putting yourself in the shoes of a mom that is either pregnant and has a newborn on when you need things done. Um, we also, one of the biggest things that we're also seeing is that moms are actually very, very worried right now. Moms are worried about the end of year performance review and a lot of them have been DMing us, emailing us saying, I don't know what I'm going to do. I think I'm going to pass out. I'm going to act like I'm sick. I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. And um, I, I will wrap up here uh, because I see Joy coming in. 
But we've had a wonderful, wonderful, um, you know, opportunity to connect with working moms. And what we're hearing is that this crisis, um, this is almost just the beginning. What we're about to see is a train wreck. And unless we stop that bleed, we will be in a much more worse position as a society in, in the years to come. All right. Thank you I'll so much. That's a blessing. <laughs> like really incredible data that has been shared during today's session. Um, blessing, thank you to you and your community for all that you've, you've shared. Um, we would like to move into a few highlights on policy before we open it up to our next session. Um, that will in involve a fireside chat, which I'm really excited about. So we got to hear already about Senator Ernst uh, and her and her proposed um, legislation, the Back to Work Child Care Grants Act. Uh, you can see here, I'm not going to read through the bullets, but you can take a quick look at um, uh, what that uh, act is looking to do. And then the Child Care is Essential Act is listed here as well. Um, this is backed by a, a couple of uh, both a, a House of Representative and a Senator um, already. And it also looks to do something similar, but establishes funds that would go through a, an existing block grant, so existing um, program to provide state funding. So we can move on to the next slide. We also just quickly wanted to highlight uh, um, a couple of policy solutions or a few policy solutions that seem to be low-hanging fruit, um, not to undermine the fact that those policy solutions addressed on the last page are critically important, um, but also that there could be some additional low-hanging pieces of low-hanging fruit that could su uh, support or build on um, either of those two acts as well. Um, you can see that there's opportunities for flexible spending accounts. So those who um, are lucky enough to have those uh, flexible spending accounts there could be some slight modifications that allow those funds to be tapped um, by uh, family members that are caring for children at home uh, and allow family members to be paid by those FSA funds. Also to allow for shared nanny care arrangements, for example, those who are really interested in in-home care solutions for a variety of, of reasons, um, that is a solution that could potentially be addressed. Uh, we've also started to talk about what about training those who've lost their jobs and are looking for new careers because perhaps industries have um, taken a, a hit, certain industries, um, to become in-home care providers, for example. You can see that there's um, some additional information there. Um, and then also uh, information about the Federal Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, the TANF program, and allowing direct child care payments for parents with infants um, in this case. And also for those members of Congress who are on the line today and those that are watching, we wanted to share there's an immediate ask, ask around maternal mental health um, that we wanna make sure we have your support for, and that is for $3.5 million to go to HRSA to fund a maternal mental health hotline uh, during full year 2021 um, next year. And the hotline would provide non-crisis support 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, to educate and support mothers and their families about maternal mental health disorders and mental health disorders to assist with care navigation. How do I find the care that I need? And next slide. With that, um, we want to welcome all of our presenters um, back on we, with their cameras on, please. And I'm really excited about this fireside chat portion of our discussion. We have a few questions that came in, but I'd like to start by asking each of you to take 30 seconds. Um, we're not gonna dive into the policy just yet, but 30 seconds to talk about anything that really resonated with you um, from our presentation today. And if we can, um, Dr. Jones-Taylor, I'd like to start with you. Was there anything that really jumped out at you in 30 seconds? No, all of it was so compelling. Thank you, Joy. I mean, I think, you know, the, collectively these numbers tell and paint a very, bleak story. Um, the number of women who are leaving the workforce, the number of families who don't feel that childcare is safe. Um, and really what this says to me is we have to have a comprehensive, uh, truly bold and robust uh, relief package so that we can really make sure that we um, come out the other side of this of this crisis um, better than we, than we went into it. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Todd Smith?
there we go. Sorry about that. I didn't know I was going to be next. So, uh, yeah, thank you so much. I, I think the conversation was so helpful and it kept uh, entering my mind what a wealth of knowledge all the presenters have to weigh in on this important topic of, of child care and working moms. Your last slide about virtual community college training for child care centers just jumped at me. I needed, I wanted to kind of go back to that. That was something that I thought might be a really good solution and I know some state models that are doing that and I, I also want to underscore the 3.5 billion CARES Act funds that have gone to child care to help sustain it. Having that flow through an existing funding stream in order to get to the state quickly I, I think is something that stood out as well that I heard. So I'll turn it back over to you. Great. Thank you for that. Um, uh, Dr. Meltzer Brody. Yeah, so I, I was just struck by the common themes we heard across all um, the presentations of there's just an enormous need and a great need for organized action and um, policy that really can move the bar in a meaningful way. So right now what we see is lack of organized policy. It's just scattershot um, and it's just not working. Um, in a really profound way, and I think the crisis of the moment gives us a real opportunity to think about how we can do better. Thank you for that. Um, blessing. Absolutely. I think it's, I think we, we have a, a higher calling, um, especially as leaders and as you know, mothers, you know, majority of us to to take this um, to all of our leaders, to all of, you know, corporation, corporate America, Wall Street, and really ensure that working mothers get the support that they need right now. Um, we all know that the economy will not, we will not have an optimal recovery if working mothers are not supported the way they should be. And so this is an opportunity. We still have the opportunity to turn this around. But that would take some serious effort on all of, from all of us, including our leaders. So let's take let's take the fight to Washington, to Wall Street, and make sure that our voices are heard. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Linda. Well, I think I was struck most by the burnout rate of women that um, Blessing had in her survey, and I think it said a lot of things to me about the need for all of us and policymakers in particular to stand back from this issue and look at the real lives of people out there. I think sometimes in Washington we get caught up in some of the, the what I call silly debates and we lose sight of what this is really all about and with numbers like that um, I think we've got some some things that need to get addressed in this country about um, mental health, social, and emotional well-being of our families during all this. How do we support their needs in a more comprehensive and global fashion? And I would second the the comment. It, it's time for Wall Street to get involved in this issue. We need business solutions as well as um, just childcare or parent solutions. Great, and Catherine. Um, I loved hearing from uh, the panelists, and um, I, I really honestly feel like I hear so much of my own experience in, in the, 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 the share, what people were sharing. But something that stuck, stood out to me was um, Dr. Uh, Metzer Brody's comments about uh, the cost of untreated mental health um, for mothers and the fact that they're actually able to put a dollar amount on that, which I thought um, not being a maternal health expert myself, I found really interesting that that's the, that 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 ignoring this problem has a real cost at $14 billion. Um, also being a postpartum mom myself, I have uh, eight month old twins. So I was definitely enjoyed the uh, <laughs> Definitely enjoyed that segment. So um, yes, but um, I think that there was so many pearls of wisdom um, from the talk. Great, um, thank you so much. I um, I found one thing that's really struck with with me, stuck with me, and that is um, that for every ten kids, uh, this was prior to COVID, I believe, and those who shared this statistic, um, please jump in here. For every ten children, there were seven childcare spots in the United States. And so to me, um, 
I know, Linda, this, is, this has been your life's work. Um, not everyone has had access to the child care centers that we are currently bailing out. And is, is that important that we bail out those centers? Absolutely, um, because they need to be there for women when they are back to work. But what about those women um, who didn't have access already? And is this an opportunity with 2020 really being a reset year for us to look differently about mother's needs? Um, and Linda, your data really struck me as, you know, what do women really want? And women um, had wanted more even prior to COVID um, in-home flexibility and childcare uh, solutions. That struck me. Um, I'd like to now um, ask any of you who may be familiar with, we have a, a wise participant who has worked in the field of maternal mental health and in childcare, um, who has asked a, a great question. And she said, when we look back in history, was there another time where women had to um, look to the government for support with childcare? And she points out that during World War II, um, we were in a similar situation where women were called to work to support the war and needed help with childcare. Um, I love that important point, And I myself am not as familiar with what happened. What was the government's response? And does anyone on the line have insight into that and any aha moments or thoughts that you want to share about what's relative today. Linda? You know, I do, and that's because some of you don't know, but my history of working with the military for 25 years, and I am familiar with what happened. And yes, um, what this country did in response to World War II is stand up a stand up childcare programs all over this country and very quickly. Um, and there was no hesitation about doing that. Um, and I think that, well, and they they really went away after the you know with, for for the most part after the war did and didn't come back until women started entering the military and could stay and you know in the military service and have a baby and that's when things changed again for the military and the military responded to that call. I think what we haven't done as a country is. Uh, because the, the progression of women back into the workforce after World War II was gradual, there was no immediate demand to do something about it. And so this response to childcare was very, very slow. And I think it's been exacerbated right now with the, with the COVID experience. Okay, so with essential workers, with low wage workers, especially women, what are we doing about that? And I think that's got the attention of a lot of people. But I think, Joy, and then I'll be short on this one, back to your point, is I think that we need to do a better job in this country of understanding what, what women and parents want. And my work over the last year has shown that we really don't understand that. We don't understand that are they not, are they choosing certain things because of that's their the only option, their preference, the only thing they can afford. Um, what, why are they making the decisions they're making? And we don't really understand that yet. We're trying, but I think we have a lot more work to do to understand that. But that said, we don't have enough childcare in this country. We didn't before the before the pandemic, and we are probably not going. We're going to have less after it, so that we're going to have to deal with this in a substantial way. A long way. Thank you. Man. Sorry, <laughs> that was great. Yeah, and and Dr. Jones, Boy Taylor, and and then Dr. Todd Smith, um, please respond. And we'd also like to know what are what are the policy solutions that you're seeing um, as low hanging or long term, quickly addressed solutions as well. Sure. And I just want to add, I mean, what, what something that Linda missed is that the military's child care, and I know she's, you know, responsible for so much of this, the military's child care program is really um, the, the gold standard that so many of us in this field have, have tracked and, and want to emulate. And, you know, we did come very close to having a universal child care system uh, much, much more recently than, than after World War II. And that was in um, 1972, we had the child development um, bill, which was gonna be this comprehensive um, child care system that was going to serve all families and it had bipartisan support. It was passed in the Senate by, uh, I think, a vote of 60, I think 63 senators voted in favor of it um, and it was vetoed by President Nixon and it has really been seen as, um, as one of the um, biggest blows to this 
system. And here we are, you know, at, at a pivotal moment um, in 2020 and thinking about the opportunity we have before us. And we have an opportunity, we clearly have the need um, with over 60% of all babies um, under the age of one have all available parents in the workforce. We are not in a situation where we can see this as a luxury or a nice to have. This is critical to every family, to most, you know, to families. And it's critical to our economy coming back. So we, we have gotten very close and there is no reason why we should not be working toward that instead of doing piecemeal um, uh, you know, attempts to do this. We really need to be thinking boldly. Families need us to do that and babies need us to do that. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Todd Smith, we'll give you the last word. Yes, thank you so much. And I'm so glad the question was asked. Uh, as I mentioned, we just celebrated our 100 year anniversary. And uh, as part of the celebration, we did a virtual Hall of Honor event into the US Department of Labor for Rosie the Riveter, which is actually a group of women that are now in their 90s that served as they call themselves the Rosie. So if you go to our website, you can see the video and hear firsthand from the women who worked during World War II about what childcare was like and the different experiences they had. So many of them, uh, we did several interviews with the women who worked during that time and talked about uh, their uh, the, uh, the manufacturing plant provided childcare on site in some cases. They had their friends and neighbors and others that family members that helped care for children. But that lends itself to a discussion that I touched on earlier about employer-sponsored childcare. We know in the United States only 11% of workers actually receive some sort of childcare benefit, like healthcare. We get retirement. Some get gym memberships, but child care is not often included and, and only 11% of working people prior to COVID were actually receiving that perk. So our my agency is working on looking at the impact of what it would be. It's very small statute change that would exempt child care from um, overtime rules. Uh, and so we're looking into that and I can share more about that. But I do think uh, some engagement from the employer perspective of trying to help pay for some of the cost of child care in order to help uh, recruit and retain workforce uh, makes makes good sense and some employers are having good success with that much like during World War II. So I'll stop there because I know you've got more on more questions on the forefront. Joy, can yeah, I just one, can I add one quick thing? It's Linda. Um, for those on the call who may be working on the Hill, the the Act was called the Lanham Act that set up the uh, the World War II child care program. So if they're interested, they might want to go take a look at that. I know it's old, but it is that was the the legislation that moved that issue. That's great, Linda. We'll make sure and and closing here that we share. Um, the name of that act. We'll also talk about um, the act in a follow-up email that um, Dr. Jones Taylor had shared from 1972 to make sure that these uh, pieces of important legislation are put right in front of all of today's attendees. We'll also share the slide deck and the recording from today's session. And just in closing, um, there is a change.org uh, petition that's being circulated for mothers who want to raise their voice about this issue that we plan to, to provide to Congress and other change agents on this topic. Um, we will circulate that. You can also find it on the Mom Congress social media channels. And then finally, you can see here on the slide, if there are any other questions that we didn't address today, you can um, contact Crystal on the Mom Congress team. Thank you to our panelists, all of you, for your unique, your unique perspective, expertise, and the data that you shared. You're helping to create this really important story around policy solutions. Um, mom, moms from Mom Congress community and, and across the United States, really thank you for your expertise. More to come. Let's create some policy solutions together. Thanks, everyone.